In today's video, we have the latest trade talk from around the NHL. We're looking at the Pittsburgh Penguins, the St. Louis Blues, the Philadelphia Flyers, the Vancouver Canucks, and the Columbus Blue Jackets today. Plus, we had significant announcements regarding the front offices of the Pittsburgh Penguins and a major change with the Edmonton Oilers. We'll discuss all the latest news and the rumors coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of things to talk about today. Uh, but first, we're going to start off with a couple of uh, changes and announcements that came from NHL teams regarding their management and front office teams here today. Uh, let's get started with the the bigger news of the two, which was the Edmonton Oilers. They, the Oilers today announced that they've hired Jeff Jackson to become the CEO of Hockey Operations. Now, in case you're not familiar, Jeff Jackson is a fairly prominent NHL player agent uh, he's a former nhl player himself i think he had a pro career for i think it was around seven eight years uh he from there uh worked in practicing law for a little while i uh, worked with the maple leafs and their front office as uh, an assistant gm as well as the gm for the marlies for a while for about four years uh, and then after that he became a player agent and then uh, from there he was the one of the uh, he started his own agency, which is basically what's become uh, Wasserman Hockey now. So obviously, um, you know Wasserman Hockey is one of the one of the bigger agencies around. Uh, his most prominent client is Oilers and NHL star player Connor McDavid. So that's the the big connection, of course, to the uh, to the Oilers. So. Now, this is a very interesting move. Jackson obviously would leave a pretty lucrative job with being the uh, you know a player agent for some prominent players. Uh, Wasserman Hockey uh, represents some of the top players in the game. Of course, not only McDavid but Austin Matthews as well. Uh, Jackson himself didn't personally represent Matthews. That's his, um, you know, obviously one of his co-workers, Jed Moldover. Uh, but Jed Moldover is actually going to be taking over the contract duties of Connor McDavid as well uh, so obviously with jackson taking on the role of ceo of the oilers now uh, obviously his clients will get reassigned some of his other prominent clients include uh, alex de brinkett who had just had a new deal done with the red wings connor brown who just obviously signed with the oilers as well and a few others so uh, they're going to get reassigned to some other uh, guys within the agency i said i know mcdavid is going under Moldover the same as Austin Matthews. So that's certainly going to make things very interesting as well. His his very first client actually was former Edmonton Oilers Sam Gagne all those years ago. I think it was 13 years ago when he first became a player agent. So this does a couple of different things. It's going to allow Bob Nicholson uh, to scale things back. We know that Bob Nicholson has been rumored to be heading towards retirement for the last little while that came out. I think it was Frank Cervelli mentioned that a few months back. So uh, this will allow... Him to scale back what he does for the Oilers. Apparently, Paul Coffey is going to take on a bigger role with the Oilers. We know he's already worked as a, like an advisor, I guess you could say. I'm not sure what his official title is, but Coffey's already worked with uh, uh, being an advisor to the upper management in Edmonton. And he's also going to be working to help make the, uh, the transition here for Jackson uh, successful as well. So Coffey played a role with uh, making this, uh, this, this happen. So obviously, like I said, this is a big, significant change. We know Ken Holland is only expected to be the GM for – uh, you know, another year or two, like he doesn't have a lot of time left on his contract. Uh, so Jeff Jackson can become part of the Oilers here and obviously be a big part in um, deciding who the next general manager of the Oilers is going to be. Certainly a big play by Edmonton to keep up uh, to do what they can. There's no guarantees, of course. But if you wanted to try to make a play to make sure that Connor McDavid stays in Edmonton, this is certainly a good way to do it. I mean, McDavid still has, I think it's three years left on his contract. So there's no, and no danger of him leaving anytime soon. But certainly surrounding the organization with one of his most trusted people that's helped look after his career with him uh, off the ice, that's certainly a wise move. It's certainly going to, you know, uh, have a lot more to it here than just uh, hopefully doing a good job for the team so that's uh, rather interesting we've seen a few other agents uh, leave the agents the agent side of the business recently and get into uh, management hockey operations ken hughes in montreal for one uh we've seen uh, like emily castangay uh you know become an agm in vancouver for example as well so certainly some interesting moves so the oilers are um obviously set up well for the future uh, obviously jackson like i said is still fairly young uh, and brings a, a you know fresh voice and everything to the organization and will certainly be there to help oversee uh you know things beyond some like with some like you know nicholson holland who won't be there 
probably for too much longer. Now, in Pittsburgh, we also saw some pretty significant news in the front office. We know that when Kyle Dubas was first hired, he was named president of hockey operations. They said they would address hiring a general manager um, likely later in the offseason, probably by the end of July or so. And they hired an assistant GM, which was Jason Spezza, who followed Kyle Dubas from the Leafs. Um, and now Kyle Dubas has named himself general manager. So he is now president and GM of the Penguins. This, I am not one bit surprised by this. Personally, I suspected this all along. Uh, obviously, a lot of his issues in Toronto with Shanahan, it was clearly a power struggle. And I kind of thought he wanted full autonomy, which the Leafs were not willing to give him, which was a big part of why he, his exit uh, took place the way it did. Now, I know a lot of people are really giving him a lot of grief for the comments he made during his final press conference as a member of the Leafs organization saying that if he's not back as the Leafs GM, that he was going to take some time and he had to talk to his family, weigh the options because the season was hard on them, and that whole spiel that he gave. And to be honest, I, I do think a lot of what he said was a negotiating tactic. And that really shouldn't come as a big surprise. I mean, clearly he wanted the Leafs to want him to stay and he wanted them to, to give him what he wanted. That never came to be. And before they could close the deal on negotiating him to stay, because they were getting close to that, Shanahan decided that he couldn't trust them and fired him. So ultimately, you know, and I think he it was all over a power struggle. That That's at least the way things sh- sure looked there. Anyway, so the fact that he's now... GM and president, and obviously taking on two roles, two very you know high uh, workload, stressful jobs. You know the the family just moved, so I, I get all that. But you know at the end of the day, I'm not one bit surprised. I, I think he wanted full control from the get go. I don't know why he was not able to be named GM right away. I'm not really sure of the strategy behind this. I don't know if there was anything in his lease contract that they had to wait because he was technically on an expiring deal. wasn't going to be a member of the Leafs uh, beyond July 1st anyway. So I don't know if there's any anything to do with that or not, but we'll, we'll may or may not ever know. He also promoted some people internally. Uh, Amanda Kessel and Trevor Daly will be taking on bigger roles within the front office. Uh, they both been promoted to be a special advisor to the president and general manager of hockey operations, which of course is himself. So Dubas, um, you know, making some changes in Pittsburgh, but nothing significant. They didn't really bring anybody in. He's just doing, uh, you know, finalizing the GM spot and making some internal promotions now onto the trade rumor section of the video uh, i want to talk first about the vancouver canucks we know that they've been in the rumor mill for some of their players for a long time tyler myers is one of those guys we haven't heard a lot about recently hasn't really we haven't talked about him on the channel here in a while hasn't had a lot of updates um earlier in the off season they were speculated that they had a deal in their back pocket supposedly to send him to the san jose sharks in exchange for kevin lebanc but that deal was on hold basically i think it was a verbal agreement but a couple of things held things up. For one, Tyler Myers has a signing bonus that's due in September. It's an odd time, and it's probably to prevent an offseason trade, which you can understand. And once that's tra- or paid, sorry, a uh, trade is much more likely because they could have him uh, for a million-dollar salary. So as much as Myers may not live up to a $6 million cap hit, you know, when the $5 million bonus is paid and they only have a million bucks for the rest of the year from a strict dollars perspective, that's actually pretty good value. I think he can play well enough to give you what a million dollar player gives you. So at the end of the day, a lot of people thought that that trade could go through maybe around the time of training camp or something like that once that's paid. Well, the other thing that's holding things up on that front too is the fact that the Sharks are in an Eric Carlson. If they don't trade Carlson, they probably don't need a right shot defenseman. If they do trade Carlson, there's a possibility they get another defenseman back and they don't need Myers in that respect. So it's complicated matters with the Carlson saga dragging on as long as it has. But ultimately, there's a new team entering the mix, and that's Columbus, apparently. Columbus apparently has expressed interest in Myers. Um, same sort of scenario where they, they would prefer that bonus to be paid. Uh, looking at the blue line, they've made some um, other changes already, You know, bringing in Damon Severson, Ivan Provorov. Um, but they still have some spots, especially in the third pair that I think they would see Myers as an upgrade. Um, for example, like, you know, Peak is a player um, that may not 
stick around if they bring in Myers. He could go the other way or maybe go somewhere else in another deal. I don't think they were super pleased with his results last year, and they might see that as an upgrade. At least that's the speculation right now, that they see Myers as being the better defender. Obviously, you know, a huge guy. If he can play physical, uh, it would certainly go a long way. But, you know, at the same time, uh, like they, he could be a short-term fix there to kind of help things along. Maybe he extends there. I mean, obviously they have some other defenders that they've brought in recently as well, but there's, you know, as much as they've kind of already revamped their blue line, they still have some, some question marks in that, you know, five, six, seven spots, and they might be willing to take him on. Now, of course, to do that though, they may want to shed a a contract too. So it's difficult to say exactly what Vancouver would take back in the deal, but at least they might have options now. Um, Of course, the, the Myers to San Jose deal is not necessarily you know, a dead deal. I'm not saying it's not happening. Uh, I think in some respects, I think it's probably the preferred method for Vancouver because uh, I think they do like the idea of seeing if LeBanc would work and kind of rejuvenate his career there because he does have some talent. Um, so I think they like that deal. But if for some reason that can't happen, then they have Columbus now expressing interest as kind of a plan B, but we'll have to wait and see. Now, as we talked about with Pittsburgh, not only are they making changes in the front office, I think they're going to continue to make changes to their roster, and a lot of that's going to come sooner than later, I think at least part of it. Uh, with the uh, signing of Drew O'Connor yesterday, as we talked about on yesterday's video, uh, that unlocks a new buyout window for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, all of their RFA business is now complete, and of course they had at least one player go to arbitration. So they have that opportunity. That window will will open up for them this weekend so they can buy out another player. Now, the only regulations with the second buyout window is that the player who's bought out has to be on the roster from the previous trade deadline. So it can't be anybody new that's been brought in since the season ended. So, uh, you know, on the roster since last trade deadline and making at least $4 million. So it's very, very likely that they do use this window. And there's two players that are just screaming a strong candidate. And I'll be curious to see how they go about this. But Mikhail Granlin, uh, they could get $5 million savings on Granlin. Um, I don't think that they are, you know, fond of that contract of the previous regime. I don't think should have ever made that trade. And I think the new regime acknowledges that. And it's like, listen, listen like, you know, he doesn't fit here. Uh, I'm pretty sure they want to move on from that if they can. So at the end of the day, uh, he's a very, very strong possibility of being bought out. Uh, Jeff Petrie is a possibility as well. Uh, I think Jeff Petrie has. See, here's the thing is I think Graylin is probably the more they get better savings. But the problem is, is on Petrie, he has more trade protection, whereas Granlin doesn't have any. If they could find a trade for Granlin, which I think if they were going to find one, they would have found it by now that they could have moved him and he didn't have any say over where he goes. But Petrie has a modified no trade. So he can block, um, I think it's like 10 or 15 teams. So ultimately, you know, they've been in these deep conversations with the Sharks about Carlson. And word is is that Petrie does not want to go to San Jose and would block that deal. Uh, So they can't take on that contract there to help level out the money in a Carlson trade. So for that reason, a buyout would be easier because then they don't have to trade them anywhere. But they would get a little bit more relief on Granlin. So I'm not sure which direction um, Kyle Dubas is going to go in here. Uh, Clearly... You know, if it he's gonna have to see if he can find a trade for one or the other and buy out the other one. It's like I can see both players likely being gone um, before the start of the season. That's if they can find a trade for at least one of them. And then, then as soon as this buyout window opens, like I said, I expect them to use it. And then from there, that's gonna intensify the trade talks around Eric Carlson and Noah Hannafin. We know the Penguins have been. Fairly engaged, more so on Carlson, but I've been picking things up on Hannafin more recently to kind of, you know, have plan B, I think, ready to go. They, they know they still have lots of time, but at the same time, time's ticking. I don't know if they want to just drag on too late into the offseason, right? So at the same time, we'll see. But Carlson and the Sharks and the uh, Penguins have been engaged all offseason. We know that Mike Greer, I don't think, feels super... Um, you know, pressured to get this deal done, whereas Carlson certainly sounds like he wants it done yesterday and does not want to go back to training camp in San Jose. I don't know how this is all going to play out, but I will say this, that business in Pittsburgh should pick up substantially in a couple of days' time. We'll see some buyouts, and then that's going to give them more flexibility to probably change and enhance some of these trade offers, and I expect either Noah Hannafin or Eric Carlson to become a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins 
sometime in the not too distant future. I don't know exactly how that's all going to play out. I'll be surprised if they don't land one of them, though. I mean, Kyle Lewis seems pretty determined, and they do have some decent options that they can include there to try to make that happen. So we'll see. But if they can free up enough space, then it makes the uh, you know the offers for these players more flexible and doesn't have to take the other team to take on so much money or reduces the, the chances of needing a third team, which gets more expensive. Now, the St. Louis Blues are another team I want to talk about. We know that they had their eye on some Flyers players early in the offseason. They did do a trade to get Kevin Hayes. Uh, that deal was supposed to be much, much bigger, but unfortunately the no-trade clause of Tory Krug prevented that from happening. Uh, the Flyers were willing to, um, to take the Krug contract and – well, it just never worked out because of his ability to block that trade. Uh, we would have seen other players like Travis Sanheim included. There was some talk about Konechny. I don't know. Uh, I've I heard different rumors about how big the trade was. I've heard as many as three pieces going to the Blues, like Hayes, Sanheim, Konechny. I heard it was only two. I, I've heard a combination of all of it, so I don't know exactly what was true, just that it was much bigger than just Hayes, which is what ended up happening. Uh, but the Blues have not given up on their pursuit of some of these players and are very much intrigued now about seeing they can work out another separate trade for Travis Konechny. Now, the Flyers do not feel one bit obligated to trade Konechny. I think they're content to keep him. Uh, he can be one of the veteran leaders. I think he actually is a player that uh, Tortorella seems to like as well. Plays with an edge, plays with some snarl, can produce offensively, can be a leader. I think they like him, so I'm, I, I don't think they feel like they have to move him. I think they're quite content to keep him, but if the Blues pony up a nice offer that works for them, then they're going to have to you know, seriously consider it. But at the same time, St. Louis can't take Konechny without moving money out. And the problem here is I think the Flyers would prefer a defenseman back. I think the Blues would prefer to shed a defenseman to get anybody like that on their roster. And the problem is, is Doug Armstrong has given all these guys too much protection of trades in their, in their contracts. They all have either a full no trade, full no move, or a modified no trade we're talking either Justin Falk, uh, Tory Krug, Nick Letty, Colton Pareko. They've all got it. So who are you going to move? Like, good luck. Uh, you know, the, the, the Flyers are, are willing to take in dance here and do some of these bigger deals, but they can't do it if the teams and players involved have protection and won't go. It's just that simple. But uh, but Konechny is certainly a player I, I suspected we're going to – I don't know that we're going to see a Konechny trade. I'd be surprised if – the Blues give them a deal they, they can't refuse and pull the trigger. I, I think he would be a fantastic St. Louis Blue, though. I would agree with that. I really do. I think he could be a real solid top six addition there in St. Louis. But um, I don't know. I mean, St. Louis has done a good job at accumulating um, some good young players in the last couple of drafts. And I don't think they're willing to part with too much of it. But, you know, would they trade maybe a future first-round pick and at least one of their decent prospects for them? I'm sure they probably would, which is certainly going to, you know, perk Philly's interest. So we'll see if anything comes together or not. Of course, no news yet on the Team Canada World Junior 2018 investigation. As we heard yesterday, there's as many as five players possibly facing significant suspensions. At least that's the speculation from some reputable sources. Um, you know, a lot of people have their theories on who the players are. I don't want to give out any names. Uh, I've had lots of conversations uh, on and off the record with different people. And I, I, I have my own theories, but I'm not going to say on camera just because I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want any, any players' reputations impacted in case the information is not accurate. Until it's announced, I can't say with certainty that I really know, but I, I do have some, some theories based on, what I've heard through the grapevine, but I suspect, and this is just my theory, I have a pretty good suspicion that we're going to get that news sometime over this coming weekend. I can see the NHL making that announcement over, um, you know, a less busy news cycle and hoping it doesn't get as much of attention because it's not going to be, you know, good for the NHL to have any of these players facing severe consequences, both legally and professionally. Either way, good chance. I think that we'll have a pretty newsworthy weekend, but again, that's not guaranteed. That's just my opinion. We'll see what happens from there. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.